Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today and an honor to speak at the Tarski Lectures. Uh, today I'd like to speak about formalizing <coughs> mathematics. On Monday, I spoke about the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture, uh, which gives uh, complete uh, verification in the whole light proof assistant of uh, that uh, conjecture and its proof. Uh, as I said the other day, uh, the formal verification uncovered hundreds of small errors. And uh, I've come to believe in the value of formal verification uh, for mathematics in general. And I'd like to <coughs> speak a little more generally today about formalization. Uh, one question that I'm asked regularly is what can be proved in a fully automated way. Uh, on Monday, I spoke about uh, interactive theorem proving in a proof assistant. And I said that it took about 20 work years to complete that one project. And so uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could just uh, do away with that 20 years of work and do everything in a fully automated way. So <clears throat> one great success story in this direction has been the Robbins conjecture. Uh, so uh, Robbins algebra is uh, an algebra. It's defined by a single binary operation or and a single unary operation of negation. And it satisfies uh, three axioms. Uh, it's associative, it's commutative, and then it satisfies this third funny relation called the uh, Robbins equation. Uh, so this, uh, the Robbins algebra came up in connection with uh, Boolean algebras and trying to find a minimal set of relations that would uh, determine uh, what a Boolean algebra is. And so for many years it was conjectured but unproven that our, all Robbins algebras are Boolean algebras. So that was the conjecture. Uh, this was finally proved in 1996. Um, so this has, became known as the uh, Robbins conjecture. It was unsolved for more than 60 years. And we have uh, Tarski to thank for the popularization of this problem because he asked it regularly to uh, his students and uh, visitors. Uh, so the proof, when it was obtained, uh, was an article, became an article in the New York Times. This is 1996. Computer math proof shows reasoning power. Uh, computers are whizzes when it comes to the grunt work of mathematics, but for creative and elegant solutions to hard mathematical problems, nothing has been able to beat the human mind, that is, perhaps, until now. So this uh, was uh, widely hailed as a, a breakthrough in full automation in mathematics, it gave uh, just a, a fully automated proof of the Robbins conjecture, a problem that had stumped mathematicians. Uh, so uh, I, a number of years ago, I took a close look at the computer proof of the Robbins conjecture and uh, building on what others had done before me to simplify it. I was able to get the proof of the Robbins conjecture down to seven steps. And these are the seven steps. It's a very complicated sequence of uh, substitutions and rewrites. So in the end, it's not a very long mathematical proof, uh, but it's certainly not the sort of thing that you would uh, probably find as a mathematician. Uh, in some sense, uh, the Robbins conjecture and its solution has been a disappointment. Uh, there was uh, all of this great publicity about how uh, computers have finally become uh, creative in their work in mathematics, uh, but we're still 
waiting for the follow-up problem to the Robbins conjecture after all of these years. So there have been other results maybe of uh, uh, simul similarly impressive, but maybe uh, not going beyond what was done in 1996. So if we look at other examples of fully automated proofs, uh, an example would be something like Cantor's theorem on uh, cardinality of power sets, uh, a group in which every element has order two is necessarily abelian. This is a, sort of a first year homework problem for students in abstract algebra, or a function has a fixed point if an iterate has a unique fixed point. Uh, so one thing that uh, these problems have in common is that they have a fairly short proof certificate that might not be easy to find, but once you find the certificate, uh, they admit fairly short proofs. Uh, if we restrict uh, to uh, classes of problems uh, in, uh, say, propositional logic, it's possible to go much further. Um, Marine Hoyle has uh, had some rather spectacular successes in solving uh, SAT problems. These are satisfiability problems uh, for uh, propositional logic. So one of them that he solved is the uh, Pythagorean triples problem. And uh, this problem uh, goes back to Ron Graham. Uh, what you do is you take the numbers one up through n and you co color each number either red or blue. And then if you have a Pythagorean triple, such as three, four, and five, numbers three squared plus four squared equals five squared is a Pythagorean triple, you ask whether that triple is monochromatic or not. Okay. And uh, what the theorem produced by uh, the SAT solver says, no matter how we color the numbers 1 up to 7, 8, 25, red or blue, there must exist a monochromatic, monochromatic Pythagorean triple. And then uh, going down by 1, but there exists a red-blue coloring uh, such that up to 17, 78, 24, such that no Pythagorean triple is monochromatic. Uh, so this, uh, when it was solved in uh, 2016, became an article in Nature. Um, the headline was 200 terabyte mass proof is largest ever. Uh, uh, Hoyle was rather upset by the title. The, the, the point is not to try to make proofs as big as possible. <laughs> uh, you could really do that quite easily. Uh, the point is to try to make proofs uh, small enough that they are within the reach of a finite computer calculation that actually terminates. Uh, so a few words about predictions and reality. Uh, 60 years ago, in the early days of artificial intelligence, it was predicted that within a decade, a digital computer will discover and prove an important new mathematical theorem. Uh, that did not happen according to schedule. Uh, we hear of many amazing accomplishments of machine learning and AI, such as natural language translation, uh, alpha zero, playing games of uh, chess and go, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, asking around, I still don't know of a major mathematical theorem that's been proved using machine learning. Uh, we're still waiting for the sequel to the Robbins conjecture. And the reality is that automation of mathematics is a very difficult problem. Uh, so I need to stress this because often, you know, I give talks about, uh, you know, the wonderful future that we have with uh, uh, formalization of mathematics. And people say, well, why don't we just uh, start a computer uh, to do a search for a proof of uh, the Riemann hypothesis? And no, we're not <laughs> nearly at the stage of being able to uh, tackle hard, unsolved mathematical problems. And yet, 
uh, I am a big believer in this technology and how it will eventually transform mathematics. Uh, one application of my work on the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture has been uh, to machine learning. Uh, so uh, the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture gave, well, if you include all of the libraries in the whole light proof assistant and all the code that we added, uh, there are about 15,000 lemmas in the system uh, covering about half a million lines of computer code. And if we want to teach a computer how to formalize mathematics, maybe we can start with a data set of things that have already been done. And so this group of uh, uh, researchers, Cesare Kalisic, uh, Cholet, and uh, Christian Segeti, at Google have uh, taken the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture and broken it up into a bunch of uh, little pieces that can be used for machine learning. So in their paper, they write, uh, uh, we focus on the whole light interactive theorem prover, its multivariate analysis library, as well as the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture. The data set now consists of more than 2 million training examples. So this is uh, one direction of application of the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture. Um, so what I've been talking about is, has been automatic theorem proving where there's very little human intervention, but uh, the reality is that it takes a lot of interaction for most complicated proofs uh, for the formalization. And so we speak more often of interactive theorem proving. And uh, one of the proof assistants uh, that I mentioned yesterday was the whole light system built by John Harrison. Uh, but there are actually many other systems that uh, get used. and. Uh, it can take a long time to learn the different uh, logics behind each of them and the capabilities of each of them. So I've just drawn a, picked a representative uh, building for each of the proof assistants. Uh, and you see that a whole light is a very minimalistic system. Uh, Lean, I'll be talking more about today is uh, currently under development by Microsoft in the bottom right. It's going to be a very massive uh, system, but it's still under construction and uh, still quite uh, difficult to use. Uh, Cock in the upper right is a very popular system. Isabel in the lower left is a very popular system. And uh, the different systems have different uh, features and advantages and disadvantages. Uh, some of the systems are based on set theory. Uh, some of the systems are based on type theory. Uh, so uh, Russell's paradox had uh, two responses, uh, the axioms of zermelo frankel and similar systems uh, leading to axiomatic set theory. Uh, but Russell himself suggested that uh, paradox could be avoided by introducing type systems. And uh, roughly speaking, just in very crude terms, um, set theory became the foundational system for doing mathematics. And type theory migrated over to computer science. And so uh, the foundations of uh, programming languages are often based on type theory rather than set theory. So as mathematics moves more and more from paper and pencil type uh, proof to computer-based proof, uh, we're facing a decision of whether to stay with set theory as we have uh, over the past decades or whether to switch to foundational systems fa favored by computer scientists. Uh, just as a cartoon, the difference between set theory and type theory, 
Uh, we think of uh, Venn diagrams when we think of set theories. They, uh, we take intersections of sets. Uh, but uh, for most types systems, types do not mix. Uh, so the basic problem with set theory is that it's not type theory. <laughs> and the basic problem with type theory is that it's not set theory. Uh, both have real advantages and disadvantages. Uh, most of these systems that I mentioned on this uh, previous slide are based on type theory. Uh, Isabel can be used with either set theory or type theory. Mizar is based on uh, set theory, but the others here are all based on some form of type theory. So just to say a few words about type theory, uh, uh, if types never mix, you have a type of natural numbers, you have a type of real numbers. So if you have a number like three, you have to say, where does that live? Is that a natural number or is it a real number? Uh, so the answer is that there are two number threes. <laughs> There's the one that's a natural number, and then there's the one that's a real number. And whenever you want to use one as the other, you have to make a, an explicit or implicit coercion from one to the other. Uh, many of these systems use what are called dependent types. This is something that's very familiar to mathematicians. Uh, for instance, we talk about R3 as a type. But uh, there's a natural number 3 that's used as the, in the description of the type, and so we have a type that's depending on a natural number, and the natural number itself is something that is uh, a value in a different type. Uh, another thing that comes up in some of these uh, systems is what's called the Curry-Howard uh, correspondence. Uh, so uh, in these pictures, I'm labeling the name of the type uh, outside the rectangle, and some of the uh, members of that type inside the rectangle. And with the Curry-Howard correspondence, uh, propositions such as 1 plus 1 equals 2 is actually a type in the system. And then the members of that type are different proofs of that proposition. So an, a proposition that has no proof would be an empty type because it has no proofs. Um, I'll say a few words about my uh, current project. Uh, this is still very much work in progress, so I won't go into much detail about it, but it's called Formal Abstracts in Mathematics. And what we're trying to do is extend uh, some of the capabilities or some of the uh, technology from computer science departments into mathematics departments so that uh, more mathematicians might find these tools useful. Uh, we're using the Lean Theorem Prover, which is uh, one of the uh, theorem provers that I flashed up as a slide. Uh, some of the advantages of this system is that, well, it has a small kernel. Uh, its logical foundations are similar to those of a, another well-known proof assistant called Koch. Uh, I won't go into technical details, but uh, this is calculus of inductive constructions. Uh, it's a very powerful system. It has a countable sequence of groton tarski universes built on top of it. Uh, it allows for both uh, constructive and classical logics. And it has uh, support for uh, homotopy type theory, the univalence axiom and, and related uh, constructions of homotopy type theory. Um, it's its own meta language, so if you program it to uh, do things, you're using the theorem prover itself to write the code. And uh, thanks to uh, master thesis last week, uh, Mario Canero, Lean stands on solid founda logical foundations. His uh, thesis works out uh, uh, a model of uh, Lean inside set theory. Uh, so our uh, current project is uh, to write down definitions and theorems of mathematics inside the Lean Theorem Prover. Uh, the motivation is that uh, mathematics influences the standards of scientific discourse. 
in the statistical sciences, in the computer science, and throughout the science. If we promote sloppy platforms, the entire world will be worse off. Sometimes there's a tendency in mathematics to do computer proofs that are fairly sloppy and without any real standards. And I'm proposing that we should uh, formalize as much as possible. Uh, so what I want to do is give statements of major mathematical theorems inside lean proof assistant and uh, definitions inside the lean proof assistant. So nobody's quite clear on how many definitions there are in mathematics. Uh, there are a lot of words in the English language. Specialized vocabularies can have hundreds of thousands of words. Uh, just looking at the mass subject classification, we know that there are over 6,000 subfields of mathematics that have all been uh, classified at various levels of detail. Uh, just take a word like the word normal in mathematics and look on wiki and uh, just following the top level classification you have long lists of different definitions of normal and then uh, you have certain disambiguation links uh, for things like normal forms and things that lead off to even more sub definitions. Or take a paper, for instance, by Sylvester. Uh, from one paper, uh, we get all of these uh, words that have uh, new meanings in mathematics that they didn't have before. We forget that words like matrix in mathematics have not always had their mathematical meaning. Uh, vocabulary of the Kepler conjecture, there are more than uh, 50 terms that have new meanings there. Uh, a lot of these look like familiar terms, like the word flat, but the word flat in the proof of the Kepler conjecture has nothing to do with the word flat, say, in algebraic geometry. Uh, or to take a more controversial example, uh, the IUT1 of Mochizuki, uh, we have a huge uh, new technical vocabulary. Um, that really has not been absorbed by the mathematical community. Uh, Michael Trott, uh, Wolfram Research, has uh, looked at math overflow data and to, just to see what are the most uh, often mentioned theorems in mathematics. And like right at the top is the uh, Chinese remainder theorem, prime number, number theorem, and so forth. Um, Kevin Buzzard, a number theorist at Imperial, asked on math overflow which mathematical definition should be formalized in lean. And uh, many people wrote in answers and ranked them according to uh, how valuable they thought different uh, formalization projects would be. Uh, the number one uh, response was the statement of the classification of finite simple groups. Uh, so, this is, so this is not giving the proof of the classification, but just stating what the theorem is that was proved. Uh, so uh, our group at Pittsburgh has taken this on as a project to, to write down the formal statement of the classification of finite simple groups. Uh, I've written a 19-page document uh, spelling out uh, sort of in uh, great detail exactly what that classification statement should look like inside the lean theorem prover. Uh, at the top level, uh, the classification just says that it has to be a cyclic group of prime order, the alternating groups for n bigger than or equal to 5, one of the finite groups of Lie type, or uh, one of the 26 sporadic groups. Uh, so, so far, the uh, group at Pittsburgh has uh, written down the 26 sporadic groups, cyclic groups, and alternating groups are not uh, much trouble, but we haven't finished the project of writing down what the groups of Lie type are. Uh, so, even asking what is a group, uh, there's the ordinary definition in terms of uh, associativity and identity and, and so forth. 
uh, but we could have a group object in a category. We could have a Poisson Lee group, which is not, uh, which doesn't fall under the group object in a category. Uh, we can have quantum groups or different kinds of quantum groups or two groups or higher categorical groups and so forth. And for the classification of finite and simple groups, uh, we're following a very structural approach which uh, calls for uh, uh, groups as uh, <coughs> affine algebraic groups. Uh, so we need to say what a group object is. Here's a bit of link code written by Jesse Hahn, part of our uh, Pittsburgh group, uh, saying what a group object is in a category. Um, so that's all I want to say about uh, this ongoing project of formal abstracts. Let's look at some of the big formalization projects that have been completed. Uh, there are four projects that I call the big four. Uh, one of them is the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture. Uh, second is the fight thompson odd order theorem that says every finite group of odd order is solvable or uh, stated another way, if you have a finite simple group, it has an element of even order, excluding the uh, cyclic groups of prime order. Uh, so those are big projects in uh, pure mathematics, but uh, there are also large projects in computer science that have been completed. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, Xavier Leroy and his group has uh, completed a proof of a verified C compiler. Uh, so this, in my mind, is just a really amazing project. So a compiler is something that will take uh, C code as a human writes it and translates it into something that can be executed on the computer. And you give a specification of what things should mean. And you prove formally that the compiler preserves uh, the meaning of what you, what you have for the computer code. So this, um, so, and as always, if, if there's a mistake in the specification of what it should do, then, uh, well, then that's a mistake and you <laughs> need to catch that. But assuming the specification is correct, everything has been formally verified. And uh, it's uh, efficient enough to be uh, competitive with some of the other uh, compilers on the market. Another major project is a verified operating system kernel by Klein and his group in Australia. And I would like to emphasize that the same tools that are used for formal verification in math, pure mathematics are used for formal verification in computer science. Uh, so uh, the whole, the Isabel system was used for part of the Kepler conjecture. It was also used for the verification of the operating system kernel. Uh, the Cox system was used for the compiler. It was also used for the odd order theorem. Okay, uh, so Jesse Hahn is uh, with us here today. He's a graduate student of mine. He can answer any questions that you might have about this project. But this is uh, uh, his uh, big announcement fre fresh off the press earlier this month. Uh, he's completed a formalization of forcing and the unprovability of the continuum hypothesis inside the lean theorem prover uh, working with uh, Floris van Dorn. So just uh, reading from his abstract, we describe a formalization of forcing using Boolean valued models in the lean th three theorem prover, including the fundamental theorem of forcing and a deep embedding of first order logic with a Boolean valued soundness theorem. Um, so I'm sure he'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have about this project. Of course, uh, the continuum hypothesis is uh, one of the great problems in uh, set theory. Uh, Hilbert's first problem uh, solved by Paul Cohen and Gödel in two different uh, directions. 
And uh, the uh, formalization here uses uh, the Boolean valued models uh, pioneered by uh, Bob Solovey and Dana Scott. Uh, so I just want to show you a couple of lines from the lean code. Uh, so there's <coughs> work by Axel and Werner that show how to put set theory into type theory. Uh, so Werner has a paper, for instance, that types in sets and sets in types that shows how to go back and forth between set theory and type theory. And it's pretty remarkable that you can put, uh, build a model of set theory inside the lean proof assistant using two lines of code. Uh, really amazing that the, the system is powerful enough that you just put all of set theory into lean with two lines of computer code. So this is this uh, line P set. Uh, the idea is that you build an inductive type. So uh, the foundations of Lean and Cock are based on inductive types. And you build an inductive type with one constructor that basically says that if you have any map from a type into sets, then you get a set. You sort of think of this as uh, uh, taking the image of a type into a set. And then uh, once you have this definition, uh, you have to, uh, this doesn't satisfy extensionality as I've written it, but you need to um, then uh, give a definition of equality that uh, gives you extensionality and you take a quotient identifying things that are equal with respect to this equivalence relation. And uh, the remarkable thing that uh, uh, Jesse and Flores found was that to build Boolean valued models inside Lean, it again just takes two lines of code and it's almost identical to the Axel Werner uh, construction. You just add one extra uh, phrase here saying that it's, uh, you've got a complete Boolean algebra B going along with it. Uh, and so then based on uh, this construction of Boolean valued models, uh, they're able to prove uh, the unprovability of the continuum hypothesis in ZFC. Uh, so Floris Van Dorn, who worked on this project, uh, did uh, homotopy type theory as a graduate student before uh, starting on this project. And uh, his PhD thesis did uh, theory of Serge spectral sequences a Tia Hertzebrook spectral sequence using homotopy type theory in the lean theorem prover. So I think between these two examples of uh, uh, continuum hypothesis and uh, the theory of spectral sequences, uh, you really see the power of this uh, particular theorem prover. And this is one of the reasons I switched from whole light over to lean is that whole light just doesn't have the, the same capabilities as uh, this uh, more powerful theorem prover. Uh, so some other major formalization projects uh, over time, uh, Gödel's first incompleteness theorem was done very early in the Boyer-Mohr system, 1986 by Schenker. Uh, the second incompleteness was added by Paulson in the Isabel system in 2013. Uh, there have been two different formal proofs of the prime number theorem, the statement that if you count the number of primes up to a given number n, that's asymptotic to n divided by the natural log of n. Uh, in the literature, there are two, there's a big division among the proofs, or the analytic proof, uh, and then uh, elementary proof of Erdős and Selberg, and both of them have been formalized in different uh, proof assistants. Uh, my first big project when I started doing formalization was a formal proof of the Jordan curve theorem. I'll say a word more about that. Uh, Georges Gontier's uh, first big project was a formalization of the computer uh, verified proof of the uh, four color theorem. Uh, so when you do a formal proof of a computer proof, 
what you're actually verifying is that the computer code has no bugs. So just to say a word about uh, my formalization of the Jordan curve theorem. Uh, so the Jordan curve theorem, of course, says that if you have any simple closed curve in the plane, then the complement of the curve has two connected components, one unbounded and one bounded. Uh, so <clears throat> some people attribute the first rigorous proof to Veblen, who was uh, Church's uh, thesis advisor. Uh, he wrote, the Jordan curve is justly regarded as the most important step in the direction of a perfectly rigorous mathematics. Uh, so I've looked at uh, Jordan's original proof, and I, it uses the language of infinitesimals, so it sounds a little bit funny, but if you write it in modern language, I don't think there's anything wrong with the original proof. Uh, so I completed a formal proof in the whole light system in 2005. Uh, it's based on a really clever proof by uh, Karsten Thomason that was published in the American Math Monthly. And uh, another proof has been completed in the Mizar system. Uh, so just to say a word about the formalization. Uh, so often the approach to the Jordan curve theorem, or the proof, is to do, you have some simple closed curve, but it might be a very complicated curve. And so uh, people often try to do, say, a, a polygon approximation of the simple closed curve and then use uh, an easy proof of the result for polygons. Uh, that's, uh, that approach is more complicated than you would think uh, just because, first of all, if you're not careful, the polygon approximation will not be a simple closed curve. And it might also change the connectivity properties in doing the approximation. Uh, but uh, Thomason's approach is to use the non-planarity of the K33 graph. So uh, this is a puzzle that I saw when I was a young boy. You have three utility companies, and you have three houses, and you want to connect each house up to each utility company, but you need to do it in such a way that the paths do not cross. Uh, so I spent a long time as a child trying to solve this puzzle, and nobody told me that the K33 graph was non-planar. <laughs> uh, so this is impossible to do. Um, but when you're talking about planarity of graphs, uh, it's, it's really an easy lemma to do uh, polygon approximations to the planarity there. You don't, uh, uh, there's no difficulty there. And so by replacing the Jordan curve theorem with this easier result about K33 and doing the polygon approximation there, everything works out much better. Uh, another spectacular project, I mentioned uh, Kevin Buzzard at Imperial uh, earlier. Uh, he has a big group of undergraduates who are doing formalizations in the Lean Theorem Prover. And one of his first year undergraduates did the local Langlands correspondence in the Abelian case uh, inside the Lean Proof Assistant. Really remarkable project. So he didn't do all of the proofs, but he uh, proved everything that he needed to build up all of the definitions and statements and so forth. Uh, so at the very end, I'd like to say just a few words about uh, controlled natural languages. Uh, so I won't show you whole light code uh, from the proof of the Kepler conjecture uh, unless you've learned the whole light system and studied it, you will find it completely impossible to read. Uh, and that's true for many of the systems. So over the years, there have been efforts to try to make formal proofs more readable. And I'll just mention a couple of uh, projects in this direction. Uh, very early on, De Bruyne had uh, something that he called math vernacular that was uh, based on English language, but it could be translated directly 
uh, in a formal way into uh, his system of weak type theory. Uh, so the Mizar system, this is one of the proof assistants that I've mentioned. They've made a big effort uh, to make the proofs uh, quite readable. And this proof style has been imitated in many of the other proof assistants. So in the next slide, I have an example of a Mizar script that you can see. And then after that, I'll show you an example in uh, Naprosh. So here is an example of an article in the Mizar system uh, dealing with the Tarski geometry axioms from 2014. Uh, this is an ongoing project with uh, articles in the most uh, recent issue of, so they, they, the Mizar system has a journal called uh, Formalized Mathematics that publishes uh, the abstracts of the uh, formal proofs that are done in the Mizar system. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, so it's fairly readable, at least compared to uh, the other proof assistants that you'll see. So for instance, we consider Tarski planes, which extend one sorted structures and or systems, a carrier, a betweenness, an equidistance, where the carrier is a set, the betweenness is a relation between such and such and the carrier. And uh, so you see this is maybe not completely natural English, but uh, it's something that uh, can be read directly by the computer. And also uh, by humans. Uh, so here, uh, my last slide, uh, this is an example from uh, Kepke, uh, who is developing uh, the Naprosh SAD system. Naprosh is uh, for natural proof checking, and SAD stands for System of Automated Deduction. Uh, so he's uh, started with a text from Rudin uh, about the Archimedean property, real numbers, and he's translated into something that can be read by computer. And you'll see that the two texts are really quite similar to one another. Uh, so if x is in R and y is in R and x is bigger than zero, then there is a positive integer n such that n times x is bigger than y. So that's uh, fairly close to uh, what we might write directly in a mathematical text. So this is something so this doesn't translate directly to one of the major proof assistants. It translates into uh, first order logic and all of the proofs are checked in first order logic. So this is uh, both an English text and it's something that's been uh, checked as uh, a proof in first order logic. So uh, when he does set theory, uh, he's not using the uh, axiomatic set theory, but he just inserts the uh, assumptions that are needed uh, to do the reasoning and first order logic. Uh, so I, th I think we can hope that uh, someday uh, systems like this might be generally accessible to mathematicians and mathematicians might uh, take the effort to learn how to express their own theorems and definitions in a language such as this that can then be automatically translated, uh, maybe not just into first order logic, but into some of the more powerful systems like, like Lean. So that's uh, my hope for the future. Thank you very much. Could you go back to your slide on the Pythagorean triples there? Yes. Where was that? There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Look at number two there. There's a coloring with no triples, yes? Now take that number 7825 and add it on to the end of number two there color it red. Immediately there must be a triple with all red things involving 7825. Color it blue. There must be a triple with blue in it. 
Now take those two triples and change the colors. And there must be another triple involving 7,825. 7, that seems to be a very remarkable number, don't you think? That it occurs in so many different Pythagorean triples. You think there's a theorem that should be suggested there about how you can represent how many times a number can occur as the hypotenuse in a Pythagorean theorem? Uh, so we have the formula for Pythagorean triples. Uh, but you see this, I have this, to, very, yes. this very example here shows that there's an awful lot of them <laughs> involving one hypotenuse. Seems awfully strange to me. Yes, good point. Oh. <laughs> I have another uh, comment too. The Robbins theorem, Robbins algebra, was the result of a mistake in transcribing the axioms for Boolean algebra. That's how the problem arose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 well, it was a good mistake. It led to this big success. <laughs> Uh, no, these systems all have different proof strengths, so you really can prove many things in some systems that you cannot in the others. For instance, whole light is uh, weaker than ZFC. It's, from what I understand, it's basically the strength of uh, ZFC without replacement. Uh, so. Is there a way of adding replacement to it in a, some natural way? Oh, <laughs> I I wouldn't know how, but <laughs> but. Uh, so it's not like they're intertranslatable languages, and you can just import something you say in one of them to the other. I mean, there is there is this model of whole light inside ZFC, and maybe that would give some clues, but I, I don't know. I have to ask an expert. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nobody, nobody has done this. So the univalence axiom allows you to transport across isomorphisms. Not okay. Uh, and, uh, so I think you're you're getting beyond what has been done. But I I think there's been some work on simplicial sets inside some of these systems, but that's, I think, as far as... Yeah, and for that one has to change, like, the basics of the whole logical foundation. So somehow, like, to formulate different kind of mathematics, one uses a little bit different foundations. So um, we cannot put everything in a single framework. Yes, I mean, people talk about homotopy type theory as if it's a single thing, but there's really an incredible amount of experimentation that's going on in that community with uh, different systems. So I think your suggestions, even if they aren't part of univalence, I think they would fit with that research program. <clears throat> Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks. This was really cool. So um, I was wondering about sort of some fundamental limitative results that people sometimes cite as saying that math can't be fully formalized. Like, for example, the undecidability of first order logic. When you would teach that in undergrad class, you would maybe say something like, oh, yeah, that shows that computers will never replace mathematicians. And so I'm wondering, uh, do these results matter at all in practice when you're trying to like, build fewer improvements, or is it just something that you don't really worry about? Uh, well, in, in my lecture on Monday, I, I think I tried to show how uh, the undefinability of truth mattered in a very practical way uh, in trying to build a model of whole light. Uh, so you have results like that. Uh, but for, for the most part, uh, these limitations don't matter day to day. You uh, mentioned that uh, the formal proof of Kessler conjecture came up with uh, hundreds of small errors in the two, uh, two series. How about the, these other, the whole list of other big projects here? I think that would come up with. Could I set up on this and why me? I have one uh, quick comment on that. I asked George Grandier about the uh, formalization of the uh, uh, unordered groups because they transcribed the published program into the formalized thing. He said, oh yes, we discovered 11 lemmas were never used in the group. <laughs> okay. uh, so my experience has been that in every major formalization project, there are many small errors that are found and corrected. Uh, most mathematical proofs are very robust in the sense that uh, these small errors usually don't destroy the overall proof. Yeah, the, uh, we had a tour of the logical we here about computer verification of the first book of Euclid. And they found an error in Euclid's proof of the existence of an angle bisector fails for a, an equilateral triangle because two points that are used to define line identify it. Uh, so. Euclid has mistakes starting from the very first proposition. <laughs> um, you mentioned a few consistency results you said have been verified. I think Bill's completeness theorem. Um, so, as far as I understand, you need you need a stronger system to prove consistency of something we hear. Can you talk about uh, kind of sort of all the systems you mentioned, uh, which ones are kind of stronger, weaker in that sense, being able to prove consistency? Uh, so, like I say, the, the cock and the lean system have a countable number of uh, universes, uh, so they're quite powerful. Uh, so. Jesse, I don't know if you can say about completeness, what that required specifically. Yeah, part of the formalization is forcing uh, the less formalized solution. Uh, so, so I think we need to improve the consistency of simple type theory and therefore chiral. Uh, for example. Can you comment a bit about the random automation in the, the various proof systems you use? Because uh, at least in computer science, there's a lot of, uh, at least one important point of configuration is the random automation in, in sort of removing the tedious aspects of using these proof systems. 
So the, the lean system that uh, I mentioned is a fairly new system. So a lot of the automation hasn't been built up yet, but there are certainly plans to do it. In whole light and many of the other major systems, they have, uh, you know, Grobner bases and, uh, you know, all the types of algebraic and arithmetic simplification tactics that you would use routinely. There are other algorithms such as uh, sums of squares and some quantifier elimination algorithms that have been programmed into many of these systems. Uh, so there's fair amount of automation. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, on Friday we're not in this room. We're in uh, 60 Evans. And uh, I was just thankful for that.